We are so important in the durability of the house, as well as the comfort and the acoustic performance of the house, but it's not appreciated until the occupant moves in. This is the one and only, the original podcast where you can find yours and your business's true value. You're listening to Our Value, brought to you by America's insulation source, IDI Distributors. You want to hear from the best contractors, suppliers, and consultants that dedicate themselves to more than just survival in the business world? Industry professionals that are dedicated to excellence in every aspect of their business? Our Value has them all here to share that same motivation and knowledge with you. Tune in and grow a more successful, profitable, educated, and recognized business. Listen to the Our Value podcast to become the industry leader in your market. Find your value with Our Value. Well, hello out there in insulation land, and welcome to the R Value Podcast. I have our treat from Owens Corning back again today. I have Mr. Joe Arrigo on the program. Joe, how are you today? Hey, good morning, Ken. I'm great. How are you? I am doing fantastic. For those of you that don't know Joe, Joe has been at this for a very long time. In fact, uh, early 2000s, he was already training people in insulation, uh, sold a company in 2003. He has been such a blessing for our trainings here at IDI. And if you've been to one of our trainings, you've probably seen Joe. But today, we are going to cover some subjects that we've never covered on the podcast and we generally don't cover in class. And that is really hopping up the operation side of your company. I'm not talking about IPAs. At least that's that's not what we're talking about, right, Joe? No, no IPAs today. Oh, okay. So, no, but hopping up the operation side of your company, Joe has several subjects, and quite frankly, I'm excited to hear it. So, Joe, uh, when we talk about, you, you mentioned demand, supply, scheduling, creative recruiting. By demand, wh- what do you mean? Well, I wanted to kind of share from an industry perspective, just so contractors know that we've been in, you know, planned availability or short supply of, of insulation materials across the entire spectrum of whether it's uh, fiberglass insulation, spray foam, mineral wool insulation. All of us have been in short supply for, for quite some time. So I thought it might be interesting to share with your audience, just from a global perspective in the United States, Anytime we hit around 1.6 million annualized housing starts, somewhere between 1.6, 1.8, all the manufacturers, particularly on the fiberglass side of it, they can run their plants, you know, uh, essentially at, you know, close to 100% and cannot produce enough insulation for the demand that that creates. So when we look at these housing starts on a month by month basis, the industry annualizes those and says, okay, if, if we continued at this pace, we're going to be, say, 1.5, 1.6 million or more housing starts. Well, the housing starts had crashed after 2007, and a lot of the industry capacity was taken out to right-size their businesses for the demand that was created. And now, now that the demand has is, is continued to increase, the manufacturers um, are scrambling to either add capacity back. And of course, during COVID, you're trying to get labor. And, um, you know, some of that capacity went went away permanently. And some manufacturers like Owens Corning had additional capacity that they could bring on. But again, that takes time. It takes uh, huge financial commitments. And most importantly, it takes a lot of human resources that, you know, you have to get up and running. And it, uh, it, it's, uh, just an interesting time. And I thought maybe we'd share with the audience that at that rate of, of housing starts, um, that's what's causing the, the shortage in our industry. Well, Joe, you, you bring up a good point because, you know, on a good day, we'll call it, how, or a good year or a good, you know, section of time, on a good day, the at running, you said 100%, really these plants completely, totally, absolutely maxed out I was told the number last year was 1.3 million houses was what was able to service. And if we're doing 1.6, that means we're short already. And so now I just got a report today from Case, you know, the equipment manufacturer, and it shows that not only are we coming out of the woodwork because COVID 
You know, moved a lot of people out of metro areas, moved them into smaller areas. We never stopped building, but now the metros are starting to come back, and they're expecting a 20% jump in non-residential construction. Now, that could be, you know, prisons. It, it could be anything from a quick way or a, you know, stop and go, wah wah mart. But to add that on top of what you just said really is quite a tax to the industry when we didn't have a perfect year. There were, there, I should say, there was equipment that went down. And even on the spray foam side, we had plants that had to shut down due to someone being injured and, and for various reasons. So we're in this force majeure type situation where materials really are, you know, call it doled out, call it what you want, but there's certainly people fighting over them. So with this supply then, how do you look at, say it's your company, how do you look at the supply challenge and adjust your company where you keep your people and you continue to make money? So I think the, the important matrix that I look at is, okay, what, what are my material needs, um, purchases annually, year over year? How much did I purchase? <clears throat> Have codes changed or impacted the uh, products that I need? And, you know, what's my plan to grow? Let's say I want to grow my, my, uh, my market by uh, 10 or 15%. Well, I'm going to look at, you know, housing starts, the amount of material, what percentage of the marketplace I might <clears throat> share today. If I'm, if I'm thinking I can grow that, that market share. And again, it gets back to, you know, kind of future casting. I know, for example, you know, based on my size of business, that for every, you know, 300 to $350,000 in fiberglass insulation we install, I'm going to need another full-time employee installing fiberglass insulation. If it's a blow truck and I know so many houses are going to be started, I know that I need two more people and another, another piece of equipment to do that. So based historically on knowing my numbers in my own business, it allows me to kind of predict where I want to go. The other thing is that um, if I just absolutely can't get enough supply, I think the other side of this is how do I remain as profitable as possible with the labor and the resources that I currently have? And that honestly means sometimes you got to fire a customer or two to maintain that, you know, what customers are my most profitable? <laughs> you know, That is exactly where I was going. I think, you, I think that's a brilliant point because there's never a better time to adjust your pricing than in this type of material constriction or you know supply chain issue because pricing when you look at it you it is time to raise it and the customers that leave that gravitate to the bottom you're not needing to replace them you can pay your people to do more maintenance you can pay them to paint the shop but if you're making more money with every product you bring through the door you're going to be better off. So I agree, this this really is the time to do that. I, I also think that you look at other businesses as well, easily bolt-on type businesses, where if you're owning more of the wall, is what we called it You know, when I was at the, the big national conglomerate, and owning more of the wall simply meant if we were doing the insulation, could we be doing the waterproofing? Could we be doing more things? And sometimes those more things really are your air and weather barrier, insulation to the outside, whatever it is, maybe you can gain more of it by being that trusted partner with some of your contractors and maybe even train your builders to make more money on the homes that they do by better knowing their customer. But it's it's kind of a sticky wicket, I guess, to steal an English term. I agree. If the more the more of the wall that we own as as contractors, sometimes there's operational efficiencies as far as scheduling. If you're doing insulation and then you're doing uh, other trades that are really focused uh, closely around insulation, for example, some people will do insulation and drywall and uh, painting. And when you're kind of in the slot where you're doing one trade and then another and another. 
not only you're solving a big problem for the general contractor, who's today more managing a process than building a building in some ways, because they're hiring trade contractors to do the work and they're just managing the schedule. Well, the more as a contractor that I control the schedule and if they're one thing after another, the more I can predict what labor I need, what materials I need, and the better I am at solving problems for the builder, just simply because I create efficiencies within their business as well. John Burns uh, Consulting, which they're, you know, the big real estate firm that if you're going to build a McDonald's or a Home Depot, they tell you, do it here, you'll make money, that kind of place. They talked about the fact that in our industry and construction as a whole, we're moving to what are called super trades. And I, I understood it as soon as he said it, but I waited for him to explain it. And sure enough, he's talking about something that uh, a guy you and I know, Ken Brown, he's a building commissioner, mentioned to me three years ago. And that is that when they're looking at seven trades touching a building envelope, a building commissioner and a code official don't want that. They want one person in charge of the entire building envelope. That way, if there's a problem with the window detail, if there's a problem with the weather barrier, if there's a problem with the insulation, that they've got one company they can go back and attach liability to. And his point was these super trades are now moving into the marketplace. Kohler is building a bunch of stores where they're going direct to the consumer. They're selling them the shower, the tub, the toilet, or whatever, but they're including the bath remodel. So there's these super trades that are starting to be seen or emerge, I guess would be a better term for it. But when I first talked to Mr. Brown, you know, three years ago at summer camp, our conversation was really about the fact in 10 years we figured there was probably going to be a building envelope contractor as opposed to these separate trades. And so that led to your next point, which was scheduling. It's funny how you, you prefaced it because scheduling was your next thing. And so with scheduling, how do you, you know, we're talking about operational efficiency. How do you work, you know, what's, what's the best attack and plan on scheduling? You know, I don't know that there's necessarily a silver bullet when it comes to scheduling. I, I'm in a lot of insulation contractors' businesses, and, you know, whether it's done on, you know, Outlook or on a whiteboard, um, you know, Google scheduling kind of things that people are kind of migrating to just simply so that they can share calendars rather than the traditional whiteboard. But a lot of times we just got to look at what capacity do we have? How many reactors, how many blow trucks, how many bat trucks do we have? And essentially you could create a, a slot for those but you need to measure capacity as far as what what is your productivity by installer or by truck or by crew or reactor so that you know that if it's going to be a multi-day job if you know that it's going to take you know two sets of spray foam and your guys are averaging three quarters to one set a day on closed cell for example that you're not going to get that job probably done in one day um, so you need to be thinking about that and scheduling it and i think you know scheduling is really tough simply because a lot of times right now we're so busy, the contractor wants a slot on our schedule. So they'll schedule something with us. And if it doesn't spat, pass inspection, of course, um, they expect us to be able to, you know, be agile enough to slip it down two or three days down the road and uh, fit it in and still keep them on schedule. And, you know, particularly we've, you know, we've talked about material and supply and labor and during this COVID time, you know, honestly, you know, sometimes you might not have a couple of installers because they're having to quarantine, for example, or the material that that uh, you needed for that job, um, you know, is not available when you need it at that time. So it's really, really tough to schedule right now. I know, you know, on mineral wool, for example, there's very long extended lead times for many of those products. And so if you're not planning and scheduling and future casting your inventory needs, and communicating that, you know, with, with, uh, you know, your sales rep, it really does help, you know, IDI does a good job just because you have such great warehouse locations across the country and are able to inventory a large amount of materials, but even you guys are constrained. But I, I think sometimes a small to medium insulation contractor doesn't feel that as much because you guys are a great buffer just simply because you have a large warehouse space and can oftentimes move materials around or, or choose a different material. Is there alternative materials? I know, for example, you know, it looks to me like the bad insulation on our side of, of things is going to be tight for all of 2022, but probably 
at some point in 2022, the loose fill insulation will not be as tight just simply because of the supply and demand in, uh, as we talked about, manufacturing ad capacity. And so I think that some contractors have got to look at net and blow walls simply because if they want to expand their business moving forward, that's going to be the product that they can get. So you have to be thinking about that, knowing that, having a plan to get the right installers trained and educated, maybe buy another piece of equipment if you don't feel like you have enough capacity on the blow truck side of it. You know, blow machines, honestly, just so you know, all the manufacturers have, have struggled to get engines for blow machines. So, the, you know, they have, we're struggling with engines for that engines for the vacuums there. You're, you're entirely correct. Yeah, and, 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 and use market's gone away. I mean, the truth is if you have a good use piece of equipment, it gets sucked up in two or three days. Yeah, that's a good point. And to your point, you know, with, with blown in, if I'm moving from bats to blow, then I also need to help the builder do the same thing. So I want to make sure if I'm going to start moving some of this over to another product, one of the real keys is training that builder's model home salespeople and the builder that this is an upgrade here's uh you know how you sell it to the consumer here's how you show them and you do charge a premium for it and let them know hey the other's going to take an additional six weeks but the upgrade's available now but i want to go backwards to something because you you talked about the whiteboard and i remember you know the whiteboard on the wall and it showed all the trucks um in one of our previous conversations we did talk about bid it and you know the nice thing about a software whatever software you use it needs to have that whiteboard you've got to be able to see and gauge how many hours your vehicle is going to be on a job site and be able to pack that schedule but you mentioned you know covid and labor what it brought me to was you could also probably save yourself some heartache if if you're low on materials you can probably save yourself some heartache, make your crews happier, and work four tens instead of five eights. Get a four day work week, have less fuel used, and maybe complete partial jobs at the end of a full job day kind of thing. So when you deal with scheduling, you can be creative. Give people three day weekends, and then you know if they like work intense, maybe you go to fifty hours when things loosen up. Maybe you don't, but either way, there's that flexibility that a good owner has to have to be able to do this. And certainly, you know, then you get into do you need lights? Is it winter time? There's there's a lot of other things, but you know we're talking about a, a lack of people, and that brings us to your fourth point. Creative recruiting. Help me, Joe. What <laughs> what what wisdom do you have there besides clubbing well, people on the street and throwing them in your truck and telling them yeah. you won't drive them home till they install? Yeah, the creative side of it. You know, I think as we do look at things outside the box, you know, our industry has typically been a you know five to six day work week, and younger people uh, today want flexibility with schedule. They want a different involvement with their businesses and their companies, and I think the companies that adapt to that are going to be a more attractive employer. Um, you know, truthfully, you know, during particularly during the longer daylight times in the summer and springtime, you know, you're able to work from you know sun up to sun down. Um, you know, need to be creative, particularly because of, of depending on where you live, the heat side of it can, can affect how long you want to be, you know, working for whether you're in a Tyvek suit or whether you're in an attic blowing insulation, you really want to be, uh, aware of that. But I think, you know, most people do a referral pr program within their company. They, they say, Hey, to their employees, if you've got somebody else in your friends and family circle that want to come to work for us, we're, you know, looking for good employees, Oftentimes, I think there's some an incentive that's there financially for a referral, but the most successful companies I see usually stagger that that payout so that they uh, incentivize the, uh, I guess you might say, the, the pressure to stay on for a longer term. So they might give somebody, say, uh, you know, after 30 or 60 days after they've referred somebody a cash payout on, on their uh, check, but then six months and 12 months later, do they, do they receive anything for that for, you know, oftentimes because they're involved in the training of that person, whether it's a family or friend. 
And just the simple thing that like, Hey, you know, if, if, if you make sure that they're happy where they're working and are trained and learn what they're doing and are, are making a, a livable or good wage, then they're apt to stay at six months or 12 months. And I think there's kind of a financial incentive that, that maybe should be offered to the employee that referred that com- that person just simply so that they are, you know, invested, let's say in making sure that that individual that they referred is a long-term success, not just a short-term solution. I think that's a great idea. I even, when you were talking, I was thinking, shoot, what if, you know, at the one year mark, you know, I, I agree with at six months, you know, give the one guy a cash bonus, but what if at the one year mark, I give them both 50 cents an hour as a raise, you know, they're, they're incentivized to keep them. And now their pay is even better. And now they're seasoned. But as you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, for creative recruiting, we're in such a digital age that why couldn't I Facebook live from a job site when I take them out lunch? Face it, millennials like food. They like to be fed at work. They, you know, Google does it. All kinds of people do it. Why wouldn't I take them lunch on the job site and be on Facebook live? And if it's here in Dallas in the summertime in a hundred and, you know, when addicts are 170, wouldn't it be cool if I had a, just a one-time thing for fun for my crew, have a water truck or somebody show up, fill up a little Walmart pool, bring them lunch, and everybody take a quick dip in one of those, you know, I'm talking like the two-and-a-half-foot side blow-up pool from Walmart. I shouldn't use a retailer, but anyway, from some store or Amazon. But, uh, you know, have fun with it and show what it's actually like to work for you and talk about the financial benefits. Interview the guy that likes to work for you. There's nothing wrong with Instagramming, TikToking. I think if we were to stream sometimes how fun construction can be, I'll bet we would get a lot more people wanting to do it. And they don't think of insulation. You know, there was that uh, when when we go train people, we talk about the study that was done. I think it was two years ago now, where they asked what the most complicated trades were, and insulation didn't even show up. They looped us in with the drywallers. People felt they could do almost everything on their own, except for electrical, HVAC, plumbing. Those all ranked at the top, but three percent named insulation and drywall together. So what? We were one percent, or were we the two? And drywall was the one. Yeah, I don't know, but. Just to show them the joy that some of these crews have and and what we experience and what it means to people. And, you know, just talking about the fact that what we do makes a difference every day. Well, let me share one of the creative things that I I saw. I wish I wish I could take credit for this. I think uh, one of my colleagues uh, actually came up with this from the marketing department. But, you know, oftentimes installers work for us. Uh, The salespeople have business cards and things like that, that they're going to give out as they're giving proposals or bids in, in, in the marketplace. But um, someone smarter than me said, hey, you know, what if we uh, not only took our recruitment campaign, but actually uh, provided business cards for every single installer at our company, but on the backside of that business card talked about, yeah, talked about what a great company we are, um, you know, that we're interested in, in, uh, you know, talented people and uh, the benefits that they offered, for example, and, and, and why come, come to work for us. So the front side of it was a, a, a business card that with pride, the, uh, the installers could give out to their, you know, friends and family and, and things like that to shows that they are a professional tradesman in our, in our industry. But the other reverse side of it was strictly a marketing piece saying what a great employer and, and uh, we're looking for talent and the uh, attributes of that company. And I thought, man, what a creative thing. Cause I think I remember that the installers that received those cards probably had never had a business card in their life. And when they went home to their, that's family, what I thought yeah, when you said yeah, that, it, that it, is awesome. And you go home and you show your, you know, show your kid's dad has a business card and, you know, uh, it, this is a profession and you give that card to your friends and family so they can get a hold of you, uh, you know, when they need to, but on the other side of it is the marketing side of it. I just, I think it, it, it did more than just was a marketing campaign. I think it honestly, it raised morale. The one thing I've learned is we travel the U S and we train contractors and, you know, new people come into the business. This is a business that requires professionals. You know, that even gets back to what we talked just briefly about blown in walls. You know, to get that premium, it's custom manufactured insulation on the job site. And that word custom 
price conditions any contractor, any homeowner. But it's true that about 40% of all the framing in these uh, new residential construction is odd spaced. So you're cutting something to fit versus I'm going to manufacture it on the job site and blow it in and, and, and make it to fit you know, perfectly for all the cavities, essentially. So again, you know, it's about making more money. It's about raising the bar, but I think the, the morale and, and we are a professional trade because it's, it's sometimes underappreciated because we're not viewed uh, in the home. We're not the granite countertops, the hardwood floors or the stainless steel appliances that, you know, is the secret recipe to uh, building a successfully selling house. But we are so important in the durability of the house, as well as the comfort and the acoustic performance of the house. But it's not appreciated until the occupant moves in. I love you say, you saying that because when you first started, I was thinking, you know, anyone can pretty much put in a KitchenAid dishwasher and all it is is a few connections. You're done and you're out of there and the people get to use it. Now, what we do... We have to find every hole, seal it up, create an environment that can become healthy, that the mechanical works. It really is a trade where now we require craftsmen. You know, back when houses just leaked, it'd get wet, dry out, get wet, dry out. We'd use tons of energy and air would blow through it. And, you know, so you put an Afghan on while you're on the couch. Those days are gone. You know, when you look at talent everywhere, is there a SEEPS program at your community, in your community with the high school level? Is there a community college that offers, you know, trade contractors that you can go and talk about insulation and maybe offer an internship to somebody who's looking to, you know, uh, have a summer job and is interested in the construction trades? Uh, you know, I mean, you got to be creative. You got to look for talent everywhere. Get involved in the community. Uh, make sure that, you know, you're getting the word of mouth out with your friends and family because, you know, maybe they have a college student coming home for the summer and they'd be, you know, a great warehouse person or supervisor or an applicator that, uh, you know, uh, over the summer can, can install for you. So, again, I, th I think it's just, you know, looking for talent everywhere is what we've got to do in today's world. Music.